I would like to uh, thank you for being very punctual because it's uh, exactly 6.30. So I'm uh, Professor Jean-Emmanuel Pondy. Uh, I'm Professor of uh, International Relations and Political Science based at the International Relations Institute of Cameroon, which is our School of Diplomacy and International Affairs. I'm um, here at uh, the DA, and I've been here for the last uh, 18 years. So I think that when I started here, many of you were probably not around or very little. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's a privilege for me to uh, address, address this audience. And uh, we're going to talk about a top topic which I'm sure is not very easy to, uh, to approach. Because as I came here at uh, the DA, I saw the official uh, statement and positioning of the academy. And uh, I've been talking to many uh, of my students and uh, my colleagues. And I realized that it is a very, very sensitive, a very emotional subject. And uh, therefore, I can assure you that I haven't come here to uh, uh, put uh, fire on a subject which is already difficult enough. Uh, I have not come here with a, an, 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 a spirit of animosity, because I think that doesn't help. What we need is exactly the reverse, uh, to be more calm, to be more collected, to lend a listening ear to each other so that things can be uh, at least discussed. Uh, nothing can be achieved through violence, through uh, um, aggressivity and so on. So my take on that is really to bring to you uh, an African perspective on this issue, which is a global issue. It's a worldwide issue. It includes uh, um, the entire humanity. And uh, there is a risk of uh, this deteriorating further. We should be very uh, extremely uh, aware of the fact that it can go other way, either way, if we're not extremely careful. So each of us, I think, should bring in uh, a good amount of reason and of, uh, and of understanding. Um, the topic of today is understanding Africa's attitude concerning the Russo-Hungarian, I'm oh, sorry, Ukrainian crisis. It is, um, of course, as I said, a topic which here is very much at the heart of people's minds. But I've come to tell you that when you live in a part of the world that has different preoccupations, different historical contexts, different historical paths, you don't see the world in the same manner in Vienna as in Kuala Lumpur, in uh, Paris as in Kinshasa. And I think that is the magic of international relations. I would like to plead with you that you take out your normal lenses, which you are being, uh, accustomed to wear, because it's difficult to change one's ways of doing things and of reasoning. Uh, we have reflexes, which have come from a long time ago, from our school days, from our uh, acquaintances. We have a certain way of reasoning. And I think that we are sometimes trapped into that way of reasoning. What I would ask you today is to please uh, voluntarily look at things from a different standpoint, because there are different standpoints when you regard an issue. And maybe when you have that kind of uh, openness, you understand better the stance of others. Life is not made up of order, ordering people to do things and think this way. If not that, you will have, have that kind of consequence. No, I think that we must be open to the fact that there may be many perspectives. The definition of globalization, given already in the 1990s, was a premonition. The definition has two parts. 
One is the globalization of international markets. And the other is the fragmentation of the political system. We are in 1990, 1992-93. So it's like a balancing act. Globalization also goes together with fragmentation. We have had a tendency to forget the second act of this phenomenon and of these dynamics. I'm afraid what we are seeing today should not surprise the good theorists who remember what is the original definition of globalization. And I think that some of you were here when I first started a long time ago. Globalization is both the globalization of markets brought about by the technological um, uh, conversation between uh, uh, ICTs on the one hand, but on the other hand also, of course, the fragmentation and segmentation of a system which is in the political arena, brought about usually by religious beliefs and so on and so forth. So these two uh, balancing acts are what we are seeing today, I'm afraid. So I will, in fact, try to answer the question, which is in most people's mind. Why is Africa not where many people thought it would be? That's to say immediately behind the Western countries as has always been the case in the past. I think that is really the question that most people have in their mind. So, but before getting to attempting an answer, it's important to look carefully at the vote, which happened on the 2nd of March, 2022, at the United Nations Organization's headquarters in Manhattan, in New York. So we'll just go through it and look at what the different African countries decided to do. Because that vote is itself an indication of where the Africans see themselves today. So when we go through that, we'll go to the second half of this uh, discussion to try to explain why we see what we have recorded on the 2nd of March, 2022. So what happened at the United Nations headquarters? Resolution um, A stroke ES L1 of the 2nd of March, 2022, passed at exactly 11.55, New York time. The terms of the resolutions were clear. It was demanding that Russia immediately stops using force against Ukraine. That could not be clear. It demands that Russia immediately stops using force against Ukraine. Do you agree with that? You vote yes. You don't agree with that, you vote no. In between is where you will find most African countries. So, in fact, the overall results were that the 100, as you know, 41 members of the United Nations approved approve the resolution, 141 out of 193, which is the current membership number of the United Nations Organization. So by and large, it can be said, as I've heard so many times, that it was a large victory. But the question is, how large was it? With the usual way uh, of diplomacy, there are many questions that needs to be asked. And that's what we're going to do uh, partially today. So five countries opposed the, the resolution, clearly of which only one African country was on that list. The five countries were Russia, of course, Belarus, Russia, North Korea, Syria, and Eritrea. Eritrea, just yet. And 
Eastern part of Ethiopia. So we will try to see who did what, because it's important. The countries of Africa, because we're dealing with countries of Africa here, that voted for the resolution, meaning for the condemnation of Russia. That is what it means. Where Benin, Botswana, Cape Verde, Chad, the Comoros Islands, Cote d'Ivoire, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Djibouti, Egypt, Gabon, the Gambia, Ghana, Kenya, Lesotho, Liberia, Libya, Malawi, Mauritania, Mauritius Islands, Somalia, the Seychelles, which are also an island, Zambia, and Sierra Leone. These are the 28 countries that voted out of the 54 African countries that are counted at the African Union today, which gives you a percentage rate of 51.85% of those who actually voted for the resolution condemning Russia. The second category of countries were those which abstained during the vote, as you say, voting neither for nor against the support of the resolution. And these were Algeria, Angola, Burundi, the Central African Republic, Congo Brazzaville, Equatorial Guinea, Mali, Mozambique, Namibia, Senegal, South Africa, South Sudan, Sudan, Uganda, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, and the Malagasy Republic, also known as Madagascar. Thus, a total of 17 countries out of 54, giving you a percentage rate of 31.48% of those who abstain. Now, the next category of states is interesting because it, these are the countries that opted to be outside of the voting premises, which means, in a way, that they should be added to those who abstain, practically because they didn't vote for the revolution, the resolution, or against the resolution. Okay. And these are among those who were absentee voters, who were not there. Somehow they found a way to do something precisely at 11, as I said, 11, 15 minutes. Okay. They, they had something to do at that time, precisely. It may happen, but in diplomacy, there's a language in diplomacy. And you understand that language, you must decode it. And uh, it was not a coincidence. These countries were, I must say, Cameroon, which is the flag of Cameroon, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Eswatini, which is, uh, as you know, which country, which, which kingdom is that? Eswatini, Swaziland. Swaziland, Guinea-Bissau, the Kingdom of Morocco, and Togo. A total of eight countries that opted for that uh, approach out of 54, giving you a percentage rate of 14.81%. In effect, you must add them to the abstentionists to be, to be rational, because they, they belong to the same um, group of countries that are not prepared to take a stand. When you get out of a, of a room, it means that you don't want to take a stand. When you refuse to pronounce yourself vis-a-vis -vis the issue, you also refuse to take a stand. Therefore, both of them 
could be uh, put in the same category. Now you have the last category, the African countries that openly opposed the UN resolution, which I mentioned before. And out of that, you have one country, Eritrea, which gives you a percentage of 1.85% out of the 55, 54 African countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I thought it was important to present this uh, uh, picture of the voting patterns so that we know what we're talking about. In fact, it depends now on where you stand when you analyze this. You can say a majority of African states from a statistical standpoint actually backed the resolution against Russia. That is a way of seeing this. And statistically, you're right. The question is, what is the history of African voting patterns? And you will see that here, it's the first time that alignment is not automatic. Especially when you take a country like Senegal, which historically has been almost automatically aligned to France on the international scene. Here, they abstain. Mali is another case, which is in close collaboration with Wagner, as we know, but they did not condemn the resolution. They also abstained. So if you look closely, you closely, there are reasons to ask many questions. The real, the real, ask, the real um, challenge here is to see that many African countries actually decided to abstain. Because there are some that cannot do otherwise, like, for instance, Libya. Libya clearly cannot do otherwise. And you have some countries like that. But uh, the, the main lesson here is that a majority of African countries, unlike previous times, have chosen to abstain. And the question, therefore, is why? And I think, ladies and gentlemen, when we ask that question, we must ask it with a, a conscience that the answer that may come is not, is not the one that you may be waiting for. Yes, because in the international arena, each country today works for the furthering of its own interests. This is exactly what you in Europe are doing and you're right to do so. It's important to understand that other concerns have the same preoccupation. So why is it that there was that lukewarm approach? Because that's what it is, really. I have two suggestions in, in terms of uh, a tentative answer. The first suggestion is the immediate reason that can trigger such a, a response. As I said, lukewarm response. And that is the degrading treatment which the African students received during this episode. It is hard to understand why students should be, in fact, taken as party, whereas they are not part of the country. They are not combatants. They are not soldiers. They are neither uh, Russian nor Ukrainian, and therefore they are outside of the whole conflict. Literally speaking, they have nothing to do with the conflict. So the question in Africa, which was asked, was why? And in fact, there are 16,000 students, African students, in Ukraine in 2022, which is huge. It's a huge number. Okay. And that information is gotten from the Brookings Institution, which are based in Washington, D.C. Okay. That's where I got that information. And an article written whose title is Russia's War and African Lives is where I picked this information. Okay. The question is, why did not the normal rules 
of conflict. Why it was not applied for this particular case? Because when there's a case like this, there's international humanitarian law which must be applied, saying that those who are non-combatant must be protected by the forces of law and order of the receiving country. That is normally what is expected. And in this case, we saw that that was not the case. Okay. So I can tell you that we were very shocked in, in Africa because we did not understand why they would be victims. All they wanted to do is go back to the country. Like everybody else. You have the French, you have the, I don't know, you have the, certainly Austrians, you have all, all nationalities. And what they were doing was to seek a way to go back to the country or to get out of the danger zone, which is normal. But the question is, why were they discriminated against? And that is difficult to understand. And that's what was observed. Uh, UNESCO, which has, uh, of course, a, a, because these were students, UNESCO has a rule, uh, the, the UNESCO, UNESCO Charter, which is the ALF, which is the executive act of UNESCO, is clear. It says that everyone has a right to, to go to acquire knowledge, whatever you can freely. Okay? So we didn't hear them, uh, in fact, try to, to defend the situation in favor of the students. Nor did we hear anything about the Red Cross, the Ukrainian Red Cross, which usually steps in in cases like this and tries to, to mend the, the problem. We didn't hear. More importantly, perhaps, was that the president of Ukraine himself did not refer to this. And that was a problem because he is the authority. Even though he's under tremendous pressure, it's true. It is not easy on a daily basis. But this should have attracted his attention and he didn't. So, in fact, this is one of the immediate cases. People were at a loss. We couldn't understand why the young Africans who've come to, 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 to acquire knowledge should be the victim of repression, but sometimes even brutality. Okay, that is the problem. And they were denied access to trains, denied access to buses, denied access to uh, any means of transportation to get out. That was very, very, very. And in fact, they were even taken hostages. So we have many, many, many uh, uh, stories which are not very good. So I think that when you realize that, in fact, these are the sons and daughters of the political leaders of Africa, and that is even more difficult. Because if you get there, it's because you have a, a good relations to get uh, scholarships. So they're not just anyone who they pick on the street. Chances are that they are related to the high decision makers of African countries They will manage to send them there. So as parents, as fathers and mothers, it will be difficult, therefore, to tell you to support those whom you have seen treating your children like that. It's human. It's not. I think everyone could can understand that. Okay. So to me, this could be one reason for the lukewarm approach, because it was like a cold shower for many Africans. We could not understand rationally, logically, why people who have nothing to do with the war should be picked upon and in fact ridiculed, uh, sometimes brutalized, not always, but sometimes. Okay. The second a reason that could explain this is more long term. And that is that has to do with something that happened in 2011. That is to say, uh, 11 years ago, 2000, and we are now in 2022. And for an African analysis, when we hear NATO for us, that can be true for sub Saharan Africa, but I think it's even more true for uh, Northern Africa. It sends you back to the demise of Muammar al Gaddafi. The question that was being asked then, given the mandate of NATO, we know that NATO means North Atlantic Treaty Organization. 
So is mandate normally extends to uh, Europe and the Americas. So we were very surprised to see that they were mandated by the United Nations organization. It's true, but to deal with an African case, which to us seemed a bit bizarre. Now, Resolution 19, Security Council 1973, is a resolution that was a bit problematic for us. The resolution said that it needs to protect the civilian Libyans, which is a good thing. And to protect even the Libyans from their the own leadership, Muammar al-Qaddafi. Muammar al-Qaddafi is not a saint. No, by, by no, no, no stretch of the imagination can you paint him as a saint. He has done horrible things. And I think it's important to stress that here. When you order the bombing of two airplanes, 747, you cannot be classified as a saint. This is an evil approach. It is a horrible thing to do and must be condemned clearly. Okay. So he's not a saint, and I'm not defending him or whatever. But I'm just trying to see what events could explain some of the African position. So NATO was therefore uh, mandated to deal with Muammar Gaddafi's Libya. Okay. The reason which was given in the resolution was to protect the innocent Libyans who were victims of a terror, terror, uh, terrorist, terrorist, I would say, political terrorist. The question which many Africans ask is on the 20th of October 2011, when he was arrested, normally he should have been transferred to the Hague because he was arrested in good physical condition. He was not sick. So we would have expected normally for him to be transferred to The Hague to answer to the International Court of Justice or the Criminal Court of Justice. That was not done. He was killed on site. One thing. The second thing which we noticed is that the situation remained the same. That is to say, the civilians were still at risk, even more so than before. And yet, Operation United Protector, that was a code name of the NATO operation. It was called, code named United Protector. United Protector was dismantled on the 31st of October. It was killed on the 20th of October, and it was dismantled despite the fact that the reason why it was put in place still lingered. So the question is, was it to protect the civilians? Or was it, in fact, to kill a sitting president? You see? So NATO, to cut a long story short, unfortunately, does not have the favor of many Africans. Why? Because once again, for the Western public. What Muhammad Gaddafi has done cannot be defended. No. He has used his troops to kill um, US military. Yes, in December 2008, in a base, I mean, the military who were going to a, to a discotheque. They were killed. And as I said, he also ordered the killing of women, children, civilians who were traveling twice. First, Lockerbie, and second, the TWA incident. A, a, a plane leaving, I think Chad going to, to Paris was also destroyed in midair. No one 
can support such 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 a evil doing. It's not possible. But that is the point of view, of course, of the West. Because what it did to the West is not acceptable. The paradox, ladies and gentlemen, and that is where there is misunderstanding, is that the same person acted in a very benevolent manner concerning most of Africa. He paid dues, he offered money, he actually worked for the um, unity of a continent. And now the question is, which Muammar Gaddafi do you, do you see? Mr. Ronald Reagan ordered a punitive raid against him on the 15th of April, 2000 and, uh, I think 2008 it was, where he killed, he, it was meant to kill him. Unfortunately, what he didn't know is that Muammar Gaddafi did not sleep in his palace, never. He always sleep in town. At seven o'clock, he went to a house, in the household, and that's where he slept. So he sent on the 15th, uh, of, of, of April, he sent 2008, he sent a, a punitive operation. They only killed his uh, adopted daughter, not himself. But the, my point is that <clears throat> by killing them, <clears throat> unfortunately, that turned many Africans against NATO. Why? Because when you take where Africa was going already, you will see that there were a lot of progress being mentioned and being observed. In fact, it is during the COVID crisis that the World Bank had to recognize that for the last 15 years, the African economy has been on an upward uh, trend. The last 15 years, between 5% and 8%. It's not enough because we, we start from very low, of course. But it is significant when you compare it to European economy, which was around 0.9%, and the American economy, US economy, around 1.7%. So it means that there, was, there were changes, even though our own economy could not deliver the same uh, results because we started from very low. But the trend was upward, and most of that was due investment, joint ventures, which he had uh, consented to do in, in Africa. So as a result, when now NATO is invoked in this particular conflict, that will not serve to rekindle enthusiasm. Yes, because people will remember what NATO did in 2011. So I think that when you look at history, you can start to understand. When you have an open mind, it's difficult, therefore, to say, if you don't align with us as the United States attempted to do, you'll be sanctioned. That is the worst thing to do. What the world needs today is more dialogue, more understanding, and even go beyond what is imaginable to look for solutions. Because we are in this thing together. When the boat sinks, it will sink for everyone. If there's a third world war, which we hope will not happen, it will be the last. There will be no more war then, as you know. The third world war is bound to be the last. When you look at the equipment, when you look at the, uh, the kind of bombs which we have today, they cannot, we cannot envisage another war after that. So everything should be done so as not to get to the brink of war. So now for the Africans, I think we are in a situation where we can probably bring the African way of resolving conflict. And what is it? The African manner of resolving conflict is to put everything on the table. It's not easy because maybe you have another way of doing things. But for us, the Palava approach is the best. 
That is, everyone comes and talks, says everything for as long as necessary. The African approach does not have the notion of time. It can take one day, it can take one week, it can take one month, doesn't matter. You have to chew out everything that you have in your mind. And people will be there to listen to you. You need to listen. So I think we can propose, because in fact, we are in the middle. The truth is that we are in the middle. We cannot support one or be against one, because in the history, neither Russia nor Ukraine have come as colonies of Africa. No. So we don't have a historical grudge against these antagonistic powers today. But will they be will listen? Will, will they be prepared to such an exercise? Because it requires also another thing, humility. The idea that we may be wrong with all the, the armament we have, with all the technology we have, the technology is one thing, but human survival is another. What is the technology for? Is it to encompass life? Is it to, 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 to make life better? Or is it to ruin the life on earth? That is the question. So I think that we as Africans, and I, that is why President um, Matiza, who is currently the president of the African Union, the president of Ukraine asked to come to Addis Ababa, Addis Ababa being the diplomatic capital of, of Africa, where the headquarters of uh, the AU are. President Makisa said, no, you don't need to come. We will do the shuttle diplomacy the way Henry Kissinger did in the 1970s. Shuttle diplomacy meaning that you go there, you talk, and then you go again, you bring the propositions there, and then back and forth for as long as it takes. So that is the proposal which Macky Sall, president of the Republic of Senegal, made. And I think that that proposal was accepted. Okay, any way we can do, anything that can be done, will be welcome, in my view. Because the situation we find ourselves now is a very tricky situation. And if the world, if the world goes to the brink, this time around, as I said, I'm not sure there will be a third world war. I'm not sure. Okay. So, what proposal can African make? First of all, is palaver diplomacy, as I said. But the other thing is maybe to highlight the possible dangers in which, because when you are in action, you don't see all the alternatives the possible outcomes of the actions which you take. They need to be told that this path leads you to this result. This option leads you to that catastrophe and so on. That needs to be done now. These realities and this truth needs to be said now before it is too late. We should not continue the ego trip where everyone thinks I'm right by definition, the other is wrong by definition. That is not the way these things will be solved, according to me. So it's important for us to have an open ear, even if you don't like a person. International relations is not a, it's not a game of love, no. It's a game of, of interest. People will take an option as far as they see that their interest is involved. It's not a matter of loving or not loving. It's a matter of, do I gain in terms of interest by taking that option? So I think that that is where we must situate the situation today. That's where we must talk to the protagonists. Now, I would like just to, to, to say a few things about racism and so on. Uh, racism is everywhere. We should, uh, we should not say that it's just, uh, it happened there, but it's happened there in Africa too, you have racism. Of course, everywhere in Asia you have racist. Everywhere you have racist. But it's important to understand that for science, you don't have the black race, the white race, the yellow race, 
the red, even I think the Indians are called red, I don't know why. That doesn't exist. Science recognizes one race, the human race, period. So these are things that we must put forward now. So we need leadership of exemplarity. I wish Nelson Mandela was still alive. I wish. Because in, in this kind of challenging situation, you need somebody who is cool-headed and who can go to the fire if necessary. And I think that in his days when he was still himself, he could have done it. Okay. He could have been maybe the person with enough integrity, enough credibility to deliver the goods in either camps and for the time being. So I think that unfortunately, we cannot resuscitate him. He's done what he could. He's dead. He died at the, at the right, respectable age for us Africans. And people, some people say, you should have also done the economic revolution. I said, no, the political revolution was already enough for a human being. Don't ask for extraordinary things. So I think that Africa today, uh, despite what I've said, despite the disappointment, which I cannot hide from you because it's true, and that is one of the reasons why you see the lukewarm attitude. People say, okay, if there is a war between Colombia and Argentina here, you will, of course, be affected because we are all human beings, but not to the same degree as one in the Balkans, because you are part of this geostrategic um, uh, ensemble. So that is why I think, in my view, we must transcend that and put ourselves in a position where if we can do something, if we can help, because at least the protagonists are not our enemies. From a historical standpoint, no, they are not. From, uh, we, we, we've worked with all of them. If you have 22,000 students, I'm saying 16,000 students in, in a country, it means a lot. It means that we know them. And somehow they know us too. So I think it's important for us to propose our services and see what can be done. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to go further than that. Uh, that's what I had uh, prepared. This is a very delicate subject, I must say. It's not the kind of uh, subjects we usually deal with. Uh, you have to approach it uh, in a very tactful manner, as tactfully as possible, not, not to add insult to injury. The situation is already uh, tense enough, difficult enough, not to bring here more fire and try to ignite uh, resentment, hatred, and animosity. We will not stand for that. We say that the human, the human race is one. Science recognizes there is one human race, and when you are in it, if the if the earth uh, blows away, all of us will blow away. That's for sure. Thank you very much indeed. Now, if you have questions, some of them I can answer. Others, I'm sure there are people in the in the in the, in the room that can answer. Yeah, uh, so we've talked a lot about humanity um, and so on, but I think uh, we should also take into account that there will be direct consequences for the African continent as well. Sure. Yeah, there will not only be, be but there are already. I mean, the rising prices of basic goods due to the embargo enforced by the Russians. So, <clears throat> I mean, then we should actually make little sense. I'm, I'm in contact with people in Ethiopia, they tell me life has become unaffordable. Uh, oil has risen by 20, like 20 times the usual price. Rains will explode. North African countries are completely dependent, like Egypt, they might start again, like let fall again into revolutions like 2011. This will have very bad and direct consequences for the entire continent. So uh, what is your take on that? Okay, I'm uh, less alarmed than you. Why? Because we have a history of our own memory. You see, when COVID-19 came, in March, late March 2019, and I remember very well, because I was in Yaoundé, and I took note on the date, the hour when I heard this. A very distinguished lady, wife of a billionaire, on a worldwide television, news, current news television, said this. 
the COVID-19 crisis will be terrible for Africa. Africa will be the epicenter, and I repeat the words, of the crisis. And the unit of dead people will be by the millions. This is what she said. And I, and I took exactly the references so that one can actually go back to that television and look. That's what we were told. Okay. And strangely enough, I hear the same words saying that Africa cannot survive this crisis. This is what I'm hearing again. So my memory, historical memory, tells me that we must be very careful. Why? Because most Africans don't eat flour. The flour, they eat, they eat it in urban areas, bread. The Arabs, yes, sure. But I'm saying in sub Saharan Africa, most people eat that in urban centers. In our villages, no one eats it. Okay. That's one thing. The second thing is now is the time for us to run away from that type of flour. We must have cassava flour, yes. We must have um, all kinds of local flour made now. And the time is now, I insist on that. Because this is an opportunity to do that. If you wanted to do that before, you could have been attacked. And you, your country could have been uh, subject to some kind of attack. But now we have every reason to say, okay, since we cannot eat, now we have to change our eating habits. In fact, in Cameroon, we already had experimented that in one of the agricultural shows which we had about 10 years ago. We, 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 we tasted it, it tasted good, but we had some warning that we should not go that way. I would not say who said that, but take my word for it. So some lobbies, it's from industrial lobbies. So now is the time. Now is the time. We cannot always continue to complain. Okay, the price is high. But the information that I want to give is that there are 800 million hectares of fallow land in Africa. 800 million hectares. That is a land which, is, which can be uh, cultivated, but which is fallow, which is not. It's time not to do it, in my view. The time is for action, it's not for complaint. We are sick and tired of those people who always are looking for excuses, or because it's easier to import, of course. It's easier because it, may, it brings you more money. And you have usually a monopoly on that trade. You have a few concerns who do only that. But it's time for us to break those monopolies and to now make the peasants and the peasantry responsible for producing food which they eat and not just food which they export, like coffee, tea, and so on. So I think even the structure of our economy and of our agriculture must change now, which is a very good thing. That's why I'm a bit less alarmist, but I understand that for now, it's a serious problem because they don't have anything to eat. They are um, used to importing, and what they use to import is not there. Therefore, this famine is true. I agree with you. But I'm saying that in the midterm, we must change the mechanics of it all. And it's not such a bad idea, in my view. What you said, okay. What you said reminded me a little bit of what it was like for you to have to do in another way. As Austria is extremely dependent on Russian gas. And we basically are waiting in home, maybe they just don't give it to us anymore. And I mean, we can, of course, buy it, which is not solving anything. But I think this could also be a change. It will be super painful, but it could be a change to uh, get more on our own feet, energy-wise, and do alternative stuff. But what I actually I wanted just to say, because you said it, and what I wanted to ask you, Libya, I have a feeling, I mean, Gaddafi was a terrible person. I don't think he was a nice man, but I do think that the average Libyan lived better under Gaddafi than up uh, and then on what came afterwards. Is it so or is this feeling that I have wrong? I'm afraid you are absolutely correct. 
that information is not made known here. And that is where somehow, unfortunately, the media tend to manipulate opinion. Okay, that, that should be made clear. Because I've been four times to Libya, personally. I can therefore, it was before the fall of the because now it's a bit dangerous to go there. What I've seen, what I have observed, was totally different from what I was hearing radio reports and television reports saying. Libya, if you wanted to conduct a political action in Libya, you were in trouble. You can be killed. But for economics and for the economic life, I don't know whether there was a country like that. I'm not sure. OK, I'm just going to give you uh, some of the macroeconomic uh, macroeconomic uh, details so that we understand what we're talking about and that you will not have it uh, in most in most uh, media structures for instance the in the, the difference between 1969 because he took power on the 1st of september 1969 27 years old, and then he relinquished power, or he was, he was ousted, to be more precise, in 2011. So the figures I'm going to give are that time span to see where Libya has gone between 1969 and 2011. Okay, I'll just take a few. The literacy rate in 1969 was 10 percent, the capacity to read and do more calculations and so on. In 2011, it was 88%. Life expectancy in 69 was 57, which already was high, because in Africa then it was in the 40, late 40s. In 19, actually, 2011, it was 74. When you take infant mortality rate from one, from, from, 1,000 life births, that's the way it is usually uh, computed. In 1969, you had 125 women who died out of 1,000, okay? In 2011, 15, 15, okay? The per capita also uh, GDP is, was in 2011, 12,062. Okay, as I said, and the human uh, HDI, human um, development index, is 0 0.755, which makes it the first in Africa, because the number one in Africa is the Seychelles. But the Seychelles is a small island. It's very easy to be number one in such an island. Okay, usually they don't have problems of water, water problems, which uh, tend to be recurrent for most African countries. But so another very striking figure is that the availability of water in households in Libya, the Libya of Gaddafi, was 96% of all the households had water. In France, it is 92%. And when I saw journalists say, we must destroy Libya because we'll bring development, we'll bring a unity, we'll bring democracy. I said something's wrong, and I wrote a book on that. I even forgot it's upstairs. I wrote a book on that because I, I said there is there's something wrong with this. It is not paradise. No, Libya was not paradise. If you want to do politics, it is not paradise for sure. Because you will be arrested, thrown to jail. And then if you get out of jail, good luck. That is what will happen to you. And we are not here to twist reality and tell lies. No. He did not want any second Gaddafi in Libya. Perhaps even in Africa, but in Libya, for sure. But if you were, you were a, 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 someone who does economics, very good. For instance, you are unemployed. Every unemployed Libyan had the basic salary of his profession. If you're an engineer, 
you will get the salary each month of engineering profession. You will not have the, anything that goes beyond that. But and that's why the reason why you didn't have you didn't have uh, refugees. Students had one thousand five hundred dollars each each year as scholarship when you were abroad. So when they finish it, go back home. You didn't have them. As I said, it was not paradise. But I would like to be much personally to live in a country like that uh, if I don't want to do politics. Okay. okay, so what you were saying is, is not incorrect. Yeah. But it is hidden. It is hidden to most Westerners. They don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. There is no any point of the citizen in the peaceful country Ukraine live their lives, touch any body in Africa, in Africa, in New York, near Russia, touch nobody. It is a peaceful country and Russia, it is a country terrorist, which came to the peaceful country with weapons. If nobody, it is uh, only one sort of boot contra terrorism. Any interest of no of any country matter. Have matter. It is point not to terrorism if fascism. United Nations must accept that we have a country fascism, where fascism is the main politic, main um, army, the, the citizen. <laughs> No, maybe. Okay, I will. Yeah, beaucoup de gens qui parlent français ici. C'est-à-dire, the the pensée de tout le monde must be the same. Uh, we have uh, there is the country terrorist, fascist, and tout le monde must. Uh, Everyone should come back. Yes. And the vote was the vote was not about if we are against or for Ukraine, but it is about if we are for terrorism or, oh, or against it. I think that's the point. If we if we have the uh, frontier, uh, they must the border, they must be limited and untouched. Hmm. Nobody must nobody um, must uh, change this. Très bien, madame. Nous sommes à l'université. Hein? Chacun, chacun a son analyse. C'est normal. What you say is what you believe in. And I think uh, you are. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> of course, I'm saying that I'm saying that your interpretation is absolutely what you believe in. But what is also the case is that. The majority of people think like you, but not everybody. Because if everybody thought like you, we would not be in the problem which we are facing today. Okay, so that's what I would say. Um, in fact, we must be very careful when we say everyone must think this way. I think the term must is not a a good one to use. Maybe should. Bonus and nobody touch the bonus. The bonus. Mm, true, very true. Okay. Anybody else, please? Yes. Oh. You speak in French or in English? Okay. 
Okay. Um, thank you first for the this uh, detailed and very interesting presentation. My concern is about this uh, Ukraine and uh, Russian uh, coming war. I can say. So um, it's about Africa. When we go back to the genesis of this uh, conflict between both of them, do you think when we go back to Africa also because we we are used to such conflict in Africa, so to us it's not something new. So we are very used to it. So, but the politics, the decision that were taken above were not um, very, I mean, uh, for us, you know, for Africa, it was not something positive that was bringing peace and, and decision that was good for everybody. Which one? Which decision? I mean, I'm talking about um, the resolution of many conflicts that are going on in Africa, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk about international relations. So do you think this, what is going on now between uh, Ukraine and Russia can be a kind of, um, can bring a new spirit, a refreshing spirit to the politicians in Africa so that they understand that the decision against Africa is what is going on now. So do you think something can change that they can renew and renew? Yes, and I mean, and bring out something uh, positive for the world Africa. Well, this is a very, I think it's a very difficult question to, to, to answer because I, I think that the contexts are not the same. Um, it seems to me that even in terms of quantities, for us in Africa, when you have less than 100,000 refugees, it's very small. Very small. We start thinking that there, there are enough refugees when you, you, you hit the 200,000 bar. That's when. But here it is, it's coming. It's too, too many people. It's also because the demographics are not the same. You know, we have 1 billion, 300, 300 million, sorry, now, and mounting. In 2050, will be 2 billion. So, so the demographics are not the same. Now, whether lessons can be learned from what is happening here, I'm, I'm skeptical. I don't, think, I don't think that the situations are really good. And I think that, uh, uh, you see, you see, normally people who know each other are, it's very dangerous when, when they are in conflict. That's why in a nation, civil wars are very dangerous compared to conventional wars. When you have a civil war, it's extremely dangerous because people know each other. They have, they have long, grudges against each other, each other, just like they may have good souvenirs. But when the worst comes to worst, then actions can be terrible. So that's why, in that case, they know each other very well, of course. So that's why I don't, I'm not sure that that can serve as a, as a case study for Africa. I, I, I think it's, it's, a different, uh, it's a different context, in my view. Um, I was wondering if there is also a positive association of some uh, African countries with Russia after um, receiving donations of the COVID vaccine, or if that's more of a propaganda thing. Okay, I see that we have to come always back to the COVID because what happened in COVID is, is, is a very mind open. It's a mind open. Um, I'm going to give you a statistic which will establish you. Out of 10 Africans, seven never set foot in a Western style health facility in their lives. Never. So I think that is a very, very telling statistic. Because when, when we hear we don't have respirators, we don't have uh, beds, we don't have. Uh, most people don't, they will never use them, never, in their lives. They couldn't care less. They don't need them, to be very honest. And 90% of COVID cases are outside of Africa. 97, sorry, 97% are outside of Africa. So the vaccine should be there also. 
outside. Why that preoccupation with the vaccines in Africa? No. You need them 100 times more than we. That is the truth. I've, I've come to, to, to Vienna. I have my own portion, which I, I was taking there. That's what I take here. It works. I'm talking about traditional medicine. We have 5,000 plants. In my village, where my village, no one died of COVID. No, nobody. And people were saying, it's not possible. You are, you are giving us fake, fake results. That's what they were, they were told. Until they came and saw and came back. So the reason why, so vaccines and so on is good. Of course, it's this. some of us who are grown up in, in the West and so on, we are very fragile. But the ones who are in the village, no. They, and they, they, they are wary of us. When we come near them, they are panicking. Because they say, you, it's you who bring us. Uh, and it's true in many ways. Okay. So, so the truth is that the pandemic showed something. Is that the image that sophisticated medicine with respirators, with, uh, uh, I don't know, what is, no, <laughs> it's not necessary. More like propaganda used to from, uh, let's say, the West and Russia. Like everyone, everyone tries to get the new market shares. Of course, yeah. the market shares. That's that's it. So the Chinese are the first ones. Of course, either even they came to Europe and gave you gave you uh, this one. The Chinese came here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they did. So it's all propaganda. It's all politics. It's all diplomacy. But most of all. It is economics, economic shares. When you have 1 billion, 300 million uh, consumers, it counts. It counts in the midterm and long term. Okay. But why have we had less? It's because, in fact, the epidemiological profile of Africans is different from you. All African children have to have vaccines. Uh, not against malaria, because we have not have malaria, but you have to take a yellow fever, cholera, all of these you have to take. So it means that you don't have that, but we have. So we are not at an equal, for once, let's say, we're not at an, at an equal vulnerability point. That's one thing. The second thing is that the pyramid of uh, demographic pyramid, half of the Africans are population is less than 18 years old. Okay, so it means that uh, the COVID has less problem with that, that portion of the population, really. And here's the, the reverse. Uh, uh, percentages are exactly the reverse. So, so for once, for once, I must say, uh, when you go to the marketplaces in Africa today, no one wears this one, nobody. I, I hope that you've been there, no one. When I, it's when I was coming here that I had to buy this. Yes. So it doesn't mean that there are no deaths. There are. There are deaths. Okay, there are deaths. People die, but it's infinitesimal. It's very small. As I said, three percent only of the world cases are in Africa. But the vaccine should be here. I would suggest mostly because this is where it makes sense. Don't worry about us so much. For once. For once. Uh, thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm oh, a student I here at the, at the um, DAES. And um, okay. so we, we often hear about the potential challenges, or not even potential challenges, the challenges for Africa as a result of this, this war in terms of uh, food security, but also in terms of security uh, dependency uh, on, on Russia uh, because of the Wagner group, for example. But my question concerns the potential opportunities for Africa as a result of this conflict. For example, I think I, I read just a few days ago uh, that the EU is now turning towards Africa for their natural resources, for gas, for oil, and at long last. And, um, sorry? I'm saying at long last. At long last. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so maybe you could elaborate on, on that a bit. 
Well, this crisis, crisis are moments of transformation. I would say, I would take that as a general philosophy. Crisis are moments of transformation. And, and you must reconsider what you were doing the way you were doing that before the crisis. The definition of a crisis is a moment when you cease to, think, to, to do things as you used to do them. Regularity gets, gets out of your way of doing things. And what becomes uh, the rule is uncertainty. That's the crisis, crisis moment. Okay. So you can take it positively. You can take it uh, just asking for help, asking for this, because that's how many in Africa have been trained, in fact. Uh, always to think that it is the responsibility of others to bring us solutions to our problems. I don't, I don't share that point of view. I think that after 60 years of independence, we must change. Okay? We must change. We must assume responsibility for ourselves. I'm not say, saying we should live in an autarchic manner uh, by, by ourselves. No, this is possible in today's world. But we must take our own responsibility as a center of our, of our action and then welcome what comes in in surplus. That's how I see things. Otherwise, today's world is too complicated. And we must manage the multiplicity of problems to solve at the same moment. So in other words, we're growing towards a complexification of the world, not a simplification. Uh, in 10 years, the world will be more difficult to handle than today. So we must prepare ourselves now, saying that that is the norm, and we'll not go back to the way things were in the 1960s. Okay. When you look at the movies of the 1960s, that, that was paradise. Okay. Not today anymore. So we must be able to answer our problems, first of all. And then if there are extra help, fine. But you cannot uh, build your own life on the hope that someone will always be there. Maybe there, he might not, because he has his own problems to solve first. And that is normal. So that's why I, I think crises are an opportunity. As you said, if we can now change, use, because what is the model, the economic model which we have in Africa? It's, it is, it is a, an unbelievable model. You produce things, you sell them. It is with the fruit of the sales that you will buy food. Does it make sense? Because if you have a seed in Africa, in, in, at least in Cameroon, in Central Africa, you have a seed, orange seed, put it there, you come back a year later, you have a tree. So why not use all that? So the model, I challenge that. I think it's not, it's not a workable model. We must change what is called the paradigm. I think you're well placed to know what the paradigm is all about. Okay, interpretation of, of a, a working system at a certain given time. So it, to me, crises are there to change our ways, to readapt to contextualize our needs and then find tools to address the problems, not to complain and not to look for help around the world. No, that time is coming closer and closer to an end, I think, and it's a good thing. Thank you very much for the brilliant presentation. I'm sorry I came a bit late and I missed quite a lot, I will say. I have uh, uh, two points on the question with two, uh, two sides. First, is um, based on uh, political analysts uh, or international relations analysts, uh, information that we've got. We've seen uh, some wars in the world categorized as proxy wars, and I will take the example of Syria in this case. And uh, would you consider which example? I, I mentioned Syria. Syria. Yes. And uh, being proxy for whom? Uh, this is the thing. I I don't I I don't want to uh, point directly. But I want to say that uh, I've read some analysis that mentioned this as a proxy war for uh, two major powers in the world. And then I'm asking directly the question: Do you consider that the what is happening at the moment in Ukraine is a proxy war between? Powers and then the second part of my question would be if uh, that's the case, um, that you're talking about two, uh, I mean, the world is polarized into two at the moment, 
what advantage are you taking to take from this to be able to uh, get full control or actually take advantage of the competition to get the maximum out of the natural resource? Thank you. I think your question is, is not easy to answer because it's not plain, it's not a plain question. So for me to answer, I need to have exactly the question which you're asking. The proxy wars for me are wars that are fought through uh, maiden partners, that is to say, people who are not real people who are interested in the war fighting for somebody else, for another power, for another country. I think the situation is already difficult enough to, to, to look for that, such interpretations. Uh, who is proxy of whom there? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Ukraine you see, was, a, was a nuclear power. You would, I think Russia had a nuclear bomb, and, and Ukraine too had one, I think, during the USSR. So it's not it's really, can you say proxy, it's like as if it, were, it was a minor partner. No, it's very rich, we're very rich uh, republic. So I'm not sure I understood what you, what you want to ask. And therefore, it's difficult for me to answer. So let me clarify um, my question. At the moment, what we understand or what we hear from the, uh, I mean, read from the news is that uh, the reason for entering into war is that the NATO has been bringing this border at uh, close to Russia. So to me, it will mean you have two camps here, the two um, uh, groups here, the group that forms the NATO and Russia. So would you consider this that um, there is uh, something proxy then? Because maybe the reason for invasion that was uh, advanced was uh, related to that. That's one of my understandings. No, no, I, I, I think the time to answer that kind of question probably is not now. Because those who hold that, you cannot change their mind. You know? And they will not listen to what you have to say. They will not change one iota their reasoning. So to me, it's a waste of time to, I'm not saying you, but I'm saying in the context of today, when people have ideas which are clear in their mind, it's difficult to, to change. Okay. Now, For me, proxy wars are wars which are very dangerous because they, the, the real actors are not on the ground. That's what I hear, right? That's what I understand by proxy wars. It means that the, the actors who are concerned are not there. They give you uh, weapons to fight, and then they are not there. I, I'm not sure that is, that is the situation today. I'm not sure. I don't have all the answers to, I must say. Yes, sir. My name is Gregory Weeks, and um, I have an expertise in genocide, in genocide research and genocide prevention. Um, and one of the adages in genocide prevention is that genocide often happens in cases of nation building. And I'd like to go to what he said, the uh, gentleman behind me, uh, because there is more or less has been a colonization by Russia of Ukraine. Uh, you know, and a genocide that occurred there in 1932, the Holy War, where four million Ukrainians were starved to death and they were trying to collect us. And my question is, um, because of the history of colonization in Africa, I wonder uh, why the African nations uh, haven't been more opposed to this, or does that not even register in their consciousness? I would be interested in that. Okay, the first genocide in modern times came, came in Africa, no? In Africa, yeah. with the heroes, 1902. And the definition of genocide is very clear, according to United Nations law. Yes. So, I don't know. There's nothing that we, we have not experienced, basically. We cannot be more sensitive because we ourselves have gone through. And uh, we understand these things. I think we understand these things. Now, what happens in Africa, in my view, is that uh, a continent cannot develop on other civilization, civilizational values. And I think that's what we have to today say when we come in a place like this, to say that in order to move forward, you need to be on your solid foundation. And your solid foundation is your cultural foundation. You cannot move forward 
by not being yourself. It is not development. It is some kind of, because for many people, it's not what you said, I'm not talking about you. I'm just reflecting now. For many people, development means de Africanization. It's exactly the reverse. If we do that, we can never develop. Never. So to me, it's important to look at culture. It's important to be at ease with yourself. That we will bring who you are and your distinctive identity to the world culture, then you will be received. But if you are a clone of others, you are a pitiful person. That's what you are, pitiful. Because you are trying to be what you are not, what you will never become. Remain who you are. So, uh, and I think today we have that problem. We have many people who, who think that in order to be considered, they must be anything by, 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 them, by themselves, but by them, themselves, anything but themselves. No. So it may seem as if I'm not answering the question, but I think when you go back to genocide, to me, it's, no, it, talks, it talks to us. I, I, I've been to the, the Ad Vashem Museum. I was, I was there in, 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 uh, in Israel. When you get out of there, you are shaken. And you wonder whether human beings can do that to other human beings. You wonder. And the answer is yes. The answer is yes, unfortunately. So we had it in 1903 with the hair rules. And I think it was even the, the basic. Europe. So we must make sure that it does not happen. We must make sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the Herrera was really, really brutal. I think, as you, I'm sure you know, most of them, they surrounded them on three sides with the army and the opening of the box. Uh, then they shot anyone who left and they poisoned the wells. So anyone who stayed in um, was poisoned uh, to death. And nobody talked about it. They swam no. under the carpet, just like other genocides in the world. True. Um, but it's about national identity. Right? Um, when genocides are established in nation building, you kill off the people who don't agree with you. Mm -hmm. True. Um, which is, we've seen things like this starting to happen in Ukraine. I don't know if you've ever heard of the CIJA, which is an organization that's based in Maine, um, mm -hmm. that is, uh, was founded by a former war crimes investigator with whom I worked. Uh, Bill Wiley. And what he does is he I says, think. It's, a, it's, an egg. it's a bunker in the head. Uh, and what they do is they smuggle out um, documents from soldiers' pockets, um, orders, the sort of things where you can establish a chain of command. Because videos don't prove anything in the International Tribunal. Mm -hmm. um, having worked with the ICTY and the ICTR, um, I have an understanding of that. And so these are things that are in people's minds, the people who are thinking about how to prosecute the crimes now that are going on. And I would think many countries, not all countries in Africa, and certainly not just that, but uh, the Sudan, um, uh, with the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, with Rwanda and Burundi, uh, all of those places have experienced genocide. Mm -hmm. And I would think that they would be more in tune with that than lots of other countries. And the time to talk about these things is now, is now, in my view. Uh, is, is, is it appropriate time to, 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 to talk about these things? Nobody wants to talk about genocide, it's not a happy part. Uh, yeah, it's better to prevent it than to be sorry about it. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I think um, we've come to the end of this. Uh, uh, both, the, both the moderator and the and then, so I have a last question. Yes. Uh, it's concerning the role of uh, Makisa, because we talk about Makisa, who is preparing uh, for the trip to so Ukraine and Russia in order to contribute also to South East issue. But I read on social media many um, people criticizing this approach because Makisa also sanctioned, he was one of the leaders, and you are aware of the, the situation of Mali where he sanctioned Mali, the important embargo on Mali, and now people also, uh, um, like, they don't have food, they are also begging him to lift the, the embargo, but if we have crisis also in Africa, why not like, try, start with the crisis, we have so many crises in Africa, why not start with those crises before 
are going to Europe and is what's like no my, my take is that uh, there's no there's no how can I say there's no necessity to start with one after you finish you go to the second after the second to the third no you can deal with them simultaneously if if need be as I was talking about the increase of complexification you, know, you must a leader must be prepared to deal with several crises at the same time. That's, good. That's really the mark of a good leader. When you deal with several crises at the same time, not, not sequence them. If you sequence them, who are you to know that this one will end at this, this time? And then when it will end, you will start uh, another one. You will not the one who decides that. It's the circumstances that decide. So you, you're not master of your time. OK, we're talking about time. Maybe I, I want to finish by that. Sorry? Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> uh, no, no. Many people say Africans are never on time. I have something to tell you. I have something to tell you. In our rural Africa, because we have to make a difference between ancestral rural Africa and urban Africa. Urban Africa is like here in the end. So let's, let's make sure about that. But in, in temporal Africa, we don't have the notion of the hour. What we have are moments. We know that the, the day is divided up in moments, not in hours. When someone says, when are you coming to visit me? Okay, I will come midday, or I'll come, I will come early morning, or I'll come late afternoon. That's the way you answer. And this is how moments are divided in the day. Early morning is from 5 o'clock until 7 o'clock. The morning is from, from 7 to around 11, 11 Midday, 11 to around 2 o'clock. And then early afternoon, 2 o'clock to 4. And then 4 o'clock is afternoon until 6. When you get to midnight, there's no visit. <laughs> because these are times when some people are out and so on. I'm talking about that. And say South Africa, OK? You don't, you don't tell someone you're going to visit in the midnight. Then you will get scared. Because there's no appointment at midnight. Okay. So we in Africa, in our traditions, we know the moments. No one will tell you, oh, you didn't come at nine o'clock. I was waiting for you at night, and you came at 9:30. It doesn't make sense in that kind of logic. I just wanted to say that because I always hear, and now we have our own biological clocks. The same person who is here, like my brother here, or my, my, my son here, my son there. Okay, what they do is. When you tell them to come at 8 o'clock, they will do when they will come at 8 o'clock. But if you're in Cameroon or whatever, they will not tell you, oh, I'll manage to come, they tell you. And they'll come during the moment, not during the time. So I want you just to make that, because some people don't understand those things. And they, they, they go in on prejudices. Because we, we work according, in fact, to nature. We don't work according to the tyranny of the clock. We don't accept the tyranny of the clock. That's why we're against that. People say that we, human beings fabricated clocks. It's not, it's not the reverse. It's not the clock that fabricated it. Okay. So I just wanted to end by this uh, humoristic note in a very, very serious topic. And uh, as I said, we should all of us work to make the situation in our small way move towards the better end. We can do it. It's not some, somebody else's responsibility. This world is ours. If it pops out, uh, all of us will go and be here next year, for sure, to present this uh, conference and any other conference, because there will be no one on Earth anymore. Thank you very much indeed.